Hey everyone, this is Baphometrics, and welcome to episode 4 of Grid School for Bitwig 3.0. As a quick reminder, every episode builds upon concepts and techniques that I demonstrate in earlier episodes. So if you haven't seen the earlier episodes, please go find my playlist for the Grid School videos and make sure you've reviewed the earlier stuff. Uh, there's a handy link to this playlist in the description for every video. So today we're going to be talking specifically about the module categories. I'm not going to go through an overview of every single module. That's like next to impossible. <laughs> You'll just learn those as you go. But I do want to explain the categorization of those modules that you see in the upper left. There's a very specific and, and distinct rhyme and reason to the way things are categorized and even the order in which these categories are displayed. And once somebody explains it to you, it makes perfect sense. So that's what I'm going to try and do for you right now. The top row of modules of categories is everything to do with input and output to the grid itself. Um, the second row is contains all of the sound generators that you might use inside the grid. These are all generators of some sort, either of sounds or of shapes. The third row has to do with subtractive synthesis and additive synthesis and mixing. So it's sort of like all the things you'll do to the sound that comes out of the sound generators. Filters, distortion shapers, delays, and of course mixing signals. And then the last row is kind of the low-level nuts and bolts the little, the little tools and widgets that you'll use throughout the design to direct and steer and shape um, and modify behaviors and signals. So we have really low-level things here like attenuators and things that'll bend the signal and things that'll do ring modulation and so on and so forth. Uh, we have some controls for pitch, like being able to quantize the pitch or scale the pitch or um, kind of do a, a, a sort of pitch tracking or based around zero crossings of waveforms, things like that. Uh, math lets you literally take signals anywhere in your grid design and multiply them or divide them or do mathematical operations on them against certain constants. Like you could take a signal and divide it by, you know, some hertz value and get some other value and then feed that into an oscillator or whatever. So there's all these mathematical functions here that can help you shape and modify raw signals. And then there's a whole set of logic oscillators that have to do with um, helping you test whether or not something is true. And depending on whether or not it's true, sending it in one direction or sending it in another direction. Um, so this is how you sort of use a lot of logic functions when you're deciding whether to send a signal to one place in your grid design or to a different place in your grid design. So in a nutshell, that's the categories. And, and whenever you're struggling to say, all right, where is that thing I want to do? Well, if it has anything to do with inputs or outputs, look in this first row. If it has anything to do with the things that generate sound or signal, look in this second row. If it has anything to do with shaping the generated sound or signal, look in the third row. And mixing is kind of like shaping because you may be blending things, all right? And then the bottom row is kind of nuts and bolts for doing really, really technical things to a signal anywhere in the grid. So let's walk through these categories kind of one by one and, and just briefly describe what's in each one. The IO category is about things that originate outside of the grid device, okay? Every one of these inputs, like the audio coming into the grid or note gates that I play on my keyboard, that's coming in through a gate in because it originates in the project outside of the grid, and then the grid's picking it up. Um, phase, we'll get to phase in another video later. That's a whole subject in itself. I'll be talking about that in episode 12. Um, but basically, you know, pitch, the, it's detecting the pitch that's coming in from the outside. If you have controllers that do pressure sensitivity, 
uh, or modify timbre, depending on whether you're sliding up or down on something like a rolly block or whether it's velocity sensitive, so on and so forth. You know, all the inputs that originate outside of the grid, even CV inputs uh, or things coming from external synthesizers or, or Euro racks, maybe audio events that are happening in a different track in the project and you want to tap that audio from a completely different track or you want to pick up audio signals that are coming from external hardware and so on. So the main thing about the I.O. block is it's pretty much stuff that happens outside the grid, either things coming into it or things you want to send out of it to other tracks or other hardware or other devices. Uh, the display section is a kind of output, if you think about it. If I want to know what uh, a particular thing is doing, like if I take this triangle shape and I add um, a Chebyshev distortion to it, and I want to know what that actually looks like. What's the output of these two modules? Well, I could take an oscilloscope and drag it here. And now if I make things a little bigger, we can see what that combined Chebyshev signal actually sort of looks like. Let me keep this up in pitch so it's more stable. So here's what my triangle wave looks like with its current skew and shape, but the Chebyshev is doing something else to it, or Chebyshev, I don't know how that's pronounced, honestly. If I disable this, you can see here's the triangle shape you're, you're kind of seeing here with the fold and the skew, right? Here's the simple triangle. Let's make it just a simple triangle again. But then if I turn on the Chebyshev again, that's what happens, right? So all these display things are a type of output. They're just, you know, how to see output of certain things inside your grid device, right? So it's still input and output of a sort. Um, and then these labels are a kind of input. If I put labels in here and put descriptive text, that's a kind of input, if you will, to somebody looking at your grid device. So then we go to phase again. I'm going to talk about this in episode 12 in detail. This is really cool and really complex, but in a nutshell, phase is the amount of time that it takes for uh, one waveform to go through its full cycle. So the time that it takes for this triangle wave to do a full cycle of its shape, that's effectively the phase. Uh, uh, how much time does it take to complete that whole waveform shape? And there's lots of games you can play with bending and warping and messing with the phase that we'll go into detail later. But that's what phase is about because phase drives oscillators. See this little purple input port and see how all these are purple? These are all basically intended somehow to modify or affect the normal linear phase of this waveform cycle. You can shorten it, you can bend it, you can warp it, you can do all kinds of interesting things to it, and that will affect what this sounds like. So it's a type of input into oscillators or anything that has a little purple input port on it. That means phase, purple for phase. Um, and then data has to do with a different type of input, which might be uh, a sequencer inside the grid that has, let's say, 16 steps to it. And this sequencer is pumping out note gates. And you can have gate on, gate off, and so on and so forth. And this could be feeding into uh, the yellow trigger inputs on your sound generators. And basically saying, generate a note here, don't generate it here, generate a note here, don't generate it here, and so on. And this is running at the speed of the, of the device phase, which is why it has a purple input port, <laughs> right? But this is used as another type of input to devices like sound generators and oscillators. Uh, you can have pitch inputs. And again, it's got purple phase for the input. You can warp and change the speed at which this moves and how it moves, but it's meant to drive the input for the pitch port on uh, oscillators. Steps is a, a different type of modulator that can uh, basically, it's still, it's still data driven, it's still step driven, it's still sequenced data, but it's more of a modulator that could like, for example, spin the phase up and down to different degrees as it moves through. 
and so on and so forth. So these are all data events of some sort. And then these little things that look like oscillators over here are very special. They have to do with phase. That's why they have a purple input port and a red output port. They're meant to be driven by this thing called a phasor right here. There's a whole different can of worms, and again, we'll talk about this in a later episode, but these are effectively also meant to do something like drive the phase of this triangle wave. Uh, I could have a saw wave that's being used to modulate this triangle wave, and then if I attach a phaser to it, I can actually do things here to modulate or phase modulate the FM of this waveform in interesting ways, but very constant ways that may or may not be tied to keyboard notes I'm actually putting in. So it's still, the point I'm making is these data modules over here, even though they look red like an audio signal, they're still meant to be used as an input to other oscillators and to other sound generators. And they're kind of meant to be used, uh, driven by a phaser or maybe by other ways of getting phase information. And they're generally meant to be uh, modulating the phase of sound generators. Okay, so everything here you can see is input oriented or output oriented in one way or another. Um, now the oscillator section is pretty straightforward. Let's simplify all this a little bit. We have our standard oscillators. You know all about these. I spent episode one talking about the swarm oscillator. I think the phase oscillator is probably kind of intuitive. I'm not sure if I'll dedicate an episode to the phase oscillator. I'll definitely have some episodes talking about the sampler at some point, but these are your basic bread and, bread and butter sound generators in the grid. Now random, uh, and let's put one oscillator back just so we have something going on here. Random is another type of generator, but it's generating either noise or maybe uh, another a type of random LFO shape or signal that can drive other things. Chance and dice are just very special variations on the concept of sample and hold or randomness. So these are still generators of some sort. They generate a signal, a regular repeating signal that's driven oftentimes by phase. So for example, this one has phase leading into it. White noise is just white noise. Pink noise is just pink noise. So there's no input to them um, and so on and so forth. LFOs are kind of similar to these random ones, but now they're not so random. Instead, these are you know shaped LFO generators that are usually a lot slower than the frequency of uh, actual pitches and sound. So these are low frequency oscillators of different shapes and sizes. Clock divider is another way of generating a regular signal based off of the um, speed that you set here. It's just going to generate a phase at a certain clock rate, and that's why its main output port is purple, because this is a way to take the regular phase that's coming in to the project and speeding up or slowing down that phase by a lot, um, changing its shape, changing how often it triggers. See over here, it's a, it's a very quick phase now. And if I drag this down to its lowest value of like one hertz or two hertz, now it's a very long phase that's exactly one kilohertz long, or one hertz long in its, in its length. So again, we'll get to phase later. This will make sense later. But it's a type of generator, a regular repeating generator like an LFO. And transport is another type of generator that basically says what's going on with your transport and your, your uh, the time, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The time signature of your transport. And we can subdivide it into things like 16th notes or 8th notes or bars or all kinds of values. And from that, we can generate certain phases at different thing, at different lengths. Um, and see how we've got a phase here and it's a little steppy because it's 16 chunks of a 30 second note. So it's kind of steppy and 16 bits like that. And the length of the phase is based on 16 30 second notes against the current tempo of the project, so on and so forth. 
And then the envelope stuff is also still a kind of generator. Right? When you take any kind of uh, signal that's constantly running, like the sine wave, and you put an amplitude envelope on it of some sort, this thing still has a timing that is based on the phase of the project, the tempo of your project. And so, you know, these attack and hold values. Well, in this case, this isn't strictly tied to the tempo of the project. It's really more just like a straight up constant time value for each stage of the envelope. But the point is it's generating a regular signal. And so it's a kind of generator. And that's why it's in this second row. So these are all the generators of some sort. Uh, filter and shaper are pretty much what you'd expect. Different kinds of low pass state variables to get your, your band pass or your high pass filters. Some more simple forms of high pass and low pass that have multiple poles on them to make them steeper or shallower. And then a comb filter. So these are all going to modify a sound signal that's coming out of one of the generators in the second row. They all shape it and modify it in certain ways. Shaper is all your distortion type um, functions. Regular distortion, quantized, rectified, wave folding, actually physically change the shape and curve. So these all modify the signals coming out of the second row of, of generators. Uh, delays, of course, delay signals, not much to say there. Some of these are a little esoteric and, and sound designers understand why they'd use these. Most of you will probably use the more simple, obvious types of delay. Um, and then the mix category is, again, it's taking potentially multiple different signals and blending them together or mixing them together with stereo pan or maybe doing very specific amounts of left and right balancing, or these are really fun. We'll have an episode dedicated specifically to these select, toggle, merge, and split functions, which can take lots of different signals and select among them or merge them together into one or choose which one of five input signals goes out of it, that kind of stuff. We have things to split uh, the standard signal path, which is stereo, we have a way to actually split it out into its left and right or mid and side components and then put it back together on the other side. That's what these two are about. And stereo width is just, of course, the balance of your mid signal to the side signal. Uh, so again, these are all about modifying or shaping the signals that are output from the generators. So, so far we have all the stuff, that, all the inputs that affect the way the sound generators or just LFO generators behave. Then we have the generators themselves. Then we have the things that shape the signal coming out of the generators. And finally, we have the low level stuff. This level section is pretty much about sound signals and what you can do with that. So we have things like attenuating or bias gain, uh, maybe defining a range of values that the sound can fall between and it won't fall outside those that set range, right? Like we can say, keep it in a really tight range and don't let it deviate from that. Um, and then a few other more esoteric things. We can take a bipolar signal and make it unipolar or vice versa, right? So this row of, of things in the level category pretty much have to do with shaping the sound itself, sound signals. Now the pitch category has to do specifically with changing pitch outputs, uh, quantizing them, cutting them up, trying to track the shift, uh, the pitch, and, and maybe do pitch detection so that you can try and build pitch shifting behavior or make decisions based on what pitch the sound is at, scaling the pitch, and even setting a specific pitch to be fed into something else and say, just always send a C5 into whatever, right? So that's what this is about. These are all nuts and bolts to modify pitch in some way or another. Um, math gets a little esoteric. The sound designers love this stuff. They wish we had more and different types of modules in here, like cosine and stuff like that. But basically, sound designers who understand 
how certain types of circuits are built. We'll use these an awful lot. You may not find much use for these, but I will be showing you a few common use cases later on that do rely on using constant values and maybe dividing things by a constant value and you know sending that output to something that makes a decision about whether to send the signal in one direction or a different direction, that kind of stuff. So you can explore these as wrong, but again, these are nuts and bolts to basically take the, the current value of a signal and modify it mathematically somehow to a very specific result. And that's all I'll say about those. And then finally, the logic stuff is going to be familiar to any of you who work in software or are familiar with software concepts. If not, a lot of this is really weird and new to you, but we'll be talking about this in a separate dedicated thing. And these all basically have to do with like comparing two things, deciding how they are with each other and in, re in relation to each other, and then making decisions to like send a signal in one direction or send a signal in a different direction. Uh, these are very tightly integrated with the two, well, with the four select, talk, well, select, merge, and split. Like you use logic functions to drive this one and this one and this one. It's all based on do two things match or not? Or if you, is one thing greater than another? Or is one thing equal to another or different from each other? And so on and so forth. So that's what most of these are about. And again, we'll have a whole episode devoted to these. So again, input, generators, shapers of the generated signal, and nuts and bolts at the bottom. So maybe that'll help you as you're trying to learn your way around and understand where do I find that thing again? Hopefully, uh, some of this, these concepts I've described will stick, and you'll remember inputs, outputs, generators, shapers, and nuts and bolts. Okay? Hope that helped, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.